Welcome to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. Yeah, from time to time you open your laptop and this message pops up and it says upgrade available. It's always at the most awkward times, if you guys notice that. Just when I can't afford it, now it wants to awkward, uh, now it wants to update. And the worst is when it auto updates. I didn't even tell it to update. And those are at the absolute worst times. You know, you're just about to start the presentation and the computer restarts. But we can come to God and the great news that I want to hold before us today is that as far as your faith and my faith is concerned, there is always an upgrade button available. We can at any stage go to God and say, God, just like we see here in Luke chapter 17, the apostles come to Jesus. These are the 12 people initially who were entrusted with carrying our faith. They were the ones who walked with Jesus the most in his three years of ministry on earth. God entrusted them. And in this time of their growth, in this time of their learning, in this time of their following Jesus, They go through a situation, they're trying to drive out the demon, there's just complications. And at one stage, they come to Jesus and they pray this really powerful prayer. I believe it's a prayer because anytime we speak to God, I think that's prayer. In Luke Luke 17, rather, and they say, the apostles say to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. Show us how to increase our faith. We've just finished a course and a whole bunch of us joined on Monday evenings where we prayed a similar prayer. Also, the apostles also coming to Jesus and they say, Jesus, teach us to pray. And we spent a couple of weeks just revisiting what is prayer and growing in our prayer life. And the next one here is that they come and they ask Jesus and they say, Jesus, would you show us to increase our faith? I want to just write at the outset, just The wording here is is really interesting because the the wording isn't only Jesus increase my faith. It's Jesus, would you show me if there's anything I can do to increase my faith? And the implication here is that this isn't only just a download that God comes and he increases our faith. We can actively engage and be part of the process of having our faith increased. The Lord answers and he said, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to a mulberry tree, or this mulberry tree is speaking to a specific one there, may you be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. And now for me, the the challenging thing about that is if I gauge my faith against that measure, I wonder if I've got faith even the size of a mustard seed. And it's weird how these things happen because I know in many areas I have faith. I can trust God as many of you do. But there are other times when I realize, God, there isn't even a mustard seed here. Perhaps we feel a little bit like this father in Mark chapter 9. His son is being tormented by a demon. There's this evil spirit and he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I know if you want, you can drive this demon out. And Jesus responds in Mark 9. He says, what do you mean if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. In other words, Jesus says, of course, I can do anything. And the father instantly cried out. And perhaps his father cries out a little bit the word that comes up in my heart often and in your hearts. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief this beautiful contrast that takes place in most of our lives that Jesus, I believe, but I don't believe. Perhaps a little bit of, I wasn't, didn't have a conversation with Brenda about this, but you know, perhaps lying there in that hospital bed, Jesus, I know you can heal this, but Jesus, I don't know if you can heal this. Jesus, I'm going to be okay because I believe you said I'm going to be okay, but Jesus, I'm not sure if I'm going to be okay. That there's this natural part of us that, seeks reassurance from God, even if there is faith in God. So Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. Jesus, I believe you can do everything, 
But right now in this situation, I'm just a little bit unsure. Help my unbelief. And his father comes and he, he prays this prayer. And I love, he instantly cries out, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And so I'm wanting us this morning and over the next two weeks, I think next week, Yaku is preaching. So the week after that, I'll carry on with that again. But we're going to be looking at just a couple of ways in which we can grow in our faith. If the disciples or the apostles came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, would you show us how to increase our faith? What are some of the things that we can perhaps do that will help our faith to increase? Thinking about faith, perhaps a good first step is to remind ourselves that every single one of us have faith. Romans 12 tells us because of the privilege and the authority God is giving me, that's Paul who's writing this letter, I give every one of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. So he's saying here, don't be spiritually pride. Don't think you are more faith, you have more faith than you really do. Don't be, try and be more of a, a person in Christ than you truly are. Be honest, be real with where you're at. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Sort of the more literal translations would say measure by the measure of faith God has assigned. Every one of us sitting here, God has assigned a measure of faith to you. And can I just maybe throw another word of grace in here for all of us? God is not going to judge you by the faith of somebody else. On the one hand, that's challenging because God isn't going to judge me by the faith of my mother. God isn't going to judge me based on how I responded or rather on how my mom responded to what God was saying to me. God is going to judge me based on, and judgment, once again, I say that word and some of us here are great and some of us here, it's a bad thing. And I love thinking of judgment simply as neutral because we can go for judgment for those, I didn't watch, but the parents, I just saw the news headlines, it was Miss South Africa yesterday and that's a judgment and somebody won. For her, that judgment is positive. The judgment is you are Miss South Africa. You qualify. You have won this whole thing because there are judges who decide this. And the point of judges is to make a judgment. So judgment isn't always a negative. Sometimes judgment is you succeeded, you passed, you qualified, you endured, you did right. Because you have been faithful, that's also a judgment. And so God will judge us not in a good way or in a bad way, in a neutral way. God will bring judgment upon us based on our own faith. For those of us who are grappling with the definition of faith, what is this faith in? Because it's this word that gets used all over the place. Here's a really powerful, but a really simple definition. Faith is simply how I respond to my revelation of God. Just what do I do because of who I know God is? How much am I able to respond to who God is? And as I understanding of who God is grows, my faith grows because I'm more able to respond when I understand how great he is. And as we grow in our revelation of his goodness, of his provision, of his hand upon our lives, it is easier to respond. But God is not going to judge me on my mom's faith. But he's also not going to judge me on my neighbor's faith. He's not going to say, your neighbor has so much faith, but you didn't. See, faith is never comparative. Faith is never going to be, oh, Philip, I'm going to line you up along a whole bunch of other people and we're going to kind of score you based. No. God will look at each one of us individually. And the powerful thing is we can come and say, Jesus, help my unbelief. We can say, Jesus, teach me to increase my faith. And as you are sitting here, God has given you a measure of faith. Every single one of us. Something else encouraging about faith, we read in 2 Thessalonians, once again, Paul writing to this group of believers. And he says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you. He says, God, we're always praying for you. We're thanking God for you as a group of believers, brothers, as is right, because your faith, is growing abundantly. Some of the other translations would say, your faith is flourishing and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Our faith 
can grow abundantly. I'm not too sure about you, but that's a prayer that I have hidden in my heart. God, I want my faith to grow abundantly. I don't want 2020, I don't want to go into 2022. And the crazy thing is some of us already begin to think about that halfway through October 2021. I don't want to go into January 2022 with the same level of faith that I had in January 2021. I want to go with increased faith. I want to go with faith that has grown abundantly. I don't want to go into tomorrow with the same faith that I went in with today. I want to trust God that God would cause my faith to grow abundantly. I want to be praying this prayer that the apostles prayed regularly and say, Jesus, would you teach me how to increase my faith? And something that I've learned about growth, whether it's spiritual growth, and we use these words a little bit interchangeably and for the purposes where we are today, They're very similar, kind of growing in spirit, growing in faith, you know, growing in our relationship with Christ. They're all intimately connected with one another. But something that I've learned about growth, Sean here somewhere, maybe he'll be able to attest to this, that healthy growth in any way hardly ever happens by accident. Healthy growth, do you know the only growth that happens by accident? It's normally the wrong type of growth. The growth when I'm lying on the couch eating too much pizza is for most of us, not the growth that I'm looking for. If I want to grow, and Sean, as I said, he just came third as an African in a, a bodybuilding competition. That growth happens very deliberately and very intentionally over time. The same if I want to grow in my profession, if I want to grow in my academics, if, I want to, if I'm a, a sports type person, if I'm anything that I'm, if I'm an artist, if I want to grow in that, I need to be deliberate about that growth. I need to find a healthy training program. I need to find out what causes growth in this thing. If I want to grow as an engineer, I need to study certain engineering subjects. I need to read engineering books. I need to study from other engineers, spend time with them. I can't just hope that tomorrow I'm going to be a better engineer than I am today. I can't just say I've got an engineering degree and a week from now after my holiday, when I come back from my holiday, I'm going to be a better engineer than I was last week. Why? Just because I'm growing. Life sadly doesn't work that way. The only stuff that grows naturally is like the stuff in my pool that I don't want to grow. It grows by accident. I have to work really hard to make sure that the bad stuff doesn't grow. To get the good stuff to grow, like next to my swimming pool, the way the roses are, or where the fruit trees, we've got one or two fruit trees in our garden, or where the, um, almost say the cabbage patch, where the little herb garden and the vegetable garden is. The only stuff that grows there by accident is the stuff that I want there. The stuff I do want there, I need to work at growing there. I need to fertilize at the right way and the right time. I need to get, you know, the right pesticides and make sure that it's watered appropriately, et cetera, et cetera. If I just leave it for a month or two or three and I come back, none of the stuff that I want to be there is going to be flourishing. All of the stuff I don't want there is going to be flourishing. And for your spirit, it's the same. For your faith, it is the same. And so, you know, sometimes when we speak to people at church, they, they miss that we actually spend time thinking about church, not only thinking about how to make the sound better and put up panels and that stuff, but we actually think about how do we grow people? How do we lead people to Christ? And how do we create environments for people to experience Christ and to hear his voice better and be able to follow him stronger? We spend time thinking about these, analyzing and You know, if if you take all of this, how do we grow in Christ together? We're probably going to find that there are six main ways in which we grow in Christ. There are six main things that grow our faith. This week, we're going to look at three. And next week, we'll look at the other three that we've identified sort of as, as church leaders. The first one, perhaps the most obvious one, is in a sense to what's happening now. Receiving practical Bible teaching. I know it's obvious, but it's amazing how many believers we think, I don't need to be taught the word. I can read the Bible for myself. I can study the Bible for myself. 
Doesn't the Bible say that I don't need anybody to teach me? It does say that, by the way, because I've got the Holy Spirit. And yet within all of that, there's a, a fundamental misunderstanding of how God has put the word together. In Romans 10, it tells us, so faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ or the word of God. Faith grows, faith comes, faith increases and expands from us knowing and being taught the word of God. I love this example of Timothy. Timothy who is a young man in the faith. Timothy who many people say has been discipled in a sense. He was taught by Paul and in many areas he was, but I love what Paul writes here. Paul writes that other people have actually had a much greater impact and influence in your faith life than I have. And how did they do that? Because in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read, you have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they have given you the wisdom to receive salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. The word there from childhood is literally from a newborn child. It's the same word that we get when a baby leaped in Elizabeth's tummy in in Luke 1. When the shepherds went out to find Jesus as a baby in the manger, that's childhood here. For those of us that are parents, you can teach your children the word of God from childhood. From when they are really, really small, we can help them to grow in the word. But the interesting thing here is, Paul doesn't say, Timothy, you have studied the word of God. You have learned to interpret the word. You have read the word. And we're not knocking any of that. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But you have been taught the word. Somebody has sat you down and taught the word. And we see Jesus doing Jesus as the model of our ministry. He spent time with the three, Peter, James, and John. He spent time with the 12, but he spent time with the 70, and he spent time with the multitudes as well. And in those times, what did he do? He spent time teaching. He was preaching at them. He was helping them grow in the faith by revealing spiritual truths to them. First Peter 2 tells us, Like newborn infants, we should long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. We should long for pure spiritual milk. And the context there, the pure spiritual milk is definitely the word of God. And I love how he writes this to believers who are not newborn infants. He writes this to mature believers and he says, but even as mature believers, there is something about the milk of the word that we never outgrow. There's a different passage where Paul's making a completely different point where he says, we shouldn't only drink milk, we should also eat meat. But this is a different picture and a different example in a different book. Here he's speaking about the purity of milk. He's speaking about the fact that it's undefiled, that it's, you know, straight from the cow. There's nothing else that's been added to it. The undefiled word, we should desire it. Just like newborn babies desire milk. We should desire the undefiled word of God all of the time. But the key thing is we don't grow only sitting under teaching. We grow most when the teaching becomes practical. For me, this is one of the biggest challenges all the time in my listening and in my preparing always because it's so easy. And we've seen this sadly as church leaders and as church historians over the centuries. It is very easy for seminaries, the place where the word of God gets taught to become cemeteries. I've got friends who went to go and study theology at some of the seminaries in South Africa. And the truth is that more of them come out of seminaries with less faith than when they went in. Some of them go in as young 17, 18, 19 year olds on fire for Jesus and they leave as agnostics or atheists. They go in with faith, believing Christ and they leave not quite sure if God even exists. And the crazy thing, it's not that they didn't study the word, but the word was taken to a place of just being as intellectual pursuit and not allowing it to change and to transform our hearts. It wasn't a, how do I apply this to my life? It's let me try to get clever about God. And just one thing that I've learned in my life so long, as long already, is the moment that we try and get clever about God, we're missing it. Because that's where pride enters. 
the moment we try and think, I can know better than God. I remember there was a time where I was convinced I'd found a mistake in Scripture. Convinced. Because I'd read in the one chapter that Jesus had fed 5,000 men and children, men not counting the women and children, with five loaves of bread and two fish. Has anybody read that story? And then a couple of days later, I was reading in a different book, still the, the Bible, and I read that he fed 7,000, and it was a different amount of bread and different. And I, Bible's wrong. It's a mistake in the Bible. My faith began to question. But I still carried on reading the word. And two or three days later, I read where Jesus stands up and he says, don't you remember the time when there were 5,000 men and we fed them with five loaves and two breads? Or the other time when there were 7,000 men? And I realized there was no mistake in scripture. There was a mistake in my understanding of scripture. I assumed that it only happened once because that's what all kind of the children's church things we always learn it happened. No, it happened twice. <laughs> twice Jesus multiplied the bread. Twice he fed the multitudes. And it's amazing how when we try and we think we're going to get clever and we've found problems in Scripture, if we keep our heart humble, God will speak to us. So it's not only about teaching. It's not only about, let's call it empty theology. Theology as a pursuit is not bad. The academic study of the Word and of God. But when it becomes non-practical, when we lose that next step, okay, how does that influence my life? You see, we grow in faith not only by hearing the word, but by applying the word. When we take the word and we begin to live it, Matthew 7, we read Jesus speaking. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. He's like a person who builds his house on a solid rock. James goes even further and he says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise you are only fooling yourselves. There have been times when I've fooled myself. When I've read these great passages of, script, passages of scripture and have not allowed it to transform my life. have not allowed it to say, okay, God, this is what your word says. It seems foolish. It seems stupid, but I'm doing it anyway. But here I go, God. And that's where faith grows. For if you listen to the word and you don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself and then you walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and you don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. God will bless you not only for hearing the word. You see, Faith comes by hearing, but faith becomes faith when it becomes action. James writes that as well. He says, faith without works is dead. You see, it's not about having an idea of how big and how great God is. It's about stepping out and saying, God, because you are great, I'm going to obey. Because you are great, I'm going to do what I sent you. Because you are great, I'm going to follow you. I had, was speaking about the lunch I had with a guy from Le Village recently, and he uses this great word. He talks about fellowship. He says, speaking about different church groups and different people that they've worked with, he says, their fellowship doesn't look like my fellowship. He's not doubting their faith. He's not doubting the statements of things that they believe, their doctrine. He's saying, but the way in which you follow Jesus looks different to the way in what I follow Jesus. I like that idea. I like that word. I don't think it's an English word, but I like the word. Our fellowship. Is our fellowship marked with faith? Something as we're thinking about growing in faith, sitting sort of in messages like these, hearing the word, and next week, Yaku, and last week, Omanton. And it's not about who is sharing, except that it's the Holy Spirit, we believe, that is using the word to transform us. Is we don't see that we are growing. Have anybody ever noticed that? You sit in a place and it doesn't feel like I'm growing. I feel like I'm stagnating. And it's every day, every moment I'm, I'm looking at myself. It's like when I go outside and I look at the vegetables in my vegetable garden, they never look like they are growing. 
The tree that you plant in your backyard, it doesn't look like it's growing because next week, maybe vegetables grow a little bit quicker, but the tree looks pretty much the same as it did last week and last month. For those of us who are parents with our kids, isn't it scary? Our kids never seem to grow, but they're always bigger. Until we see a friend's kids who we haven't seen, like in lockdown, we've all noticed that. You know, Theo, he just got a whole new baby during lockdown. We were in the Western Cape with some other pastors, as I mentioned last week, and walked up to one of the pastor's wives. And I remember she was pregnant and she was holding like a two-year-old, three-year-old baby, three-year-old baby. And I was like, this can't be the youngest. It's impossible. She says, no, it's not. And she turned around and said, there's the little, oh, okay. So there's the little one. But kind of we lose context when we don't see you regularly because we realize people are growing. It's the same when people look at us from the outside. We don't see ourselves growing, but that's not because we're not growing. If we get to a a third session on, on this topic, what I'll probably do is, what are some measurements of our growth? How can we see, am I growing spiritually? Because when we're young in the faith, things, it feels like we're growing all the time because life is different. We can see our habits are changing. Last week I went and got drunk. I didn't get drunk this week. Great, that's a win. But a year, a decade in and following Jesus, am I still growing? We can look at some ways in which we can measure our growth. But one of the things that we shouldn't do is we shouldn't get disheartened because it doesn't look like we're growing on the outside. One of the ways in which we can grow is go to the people around you and say, does it look to you like I am growing? Because they normally have a more objective view around that. Growth from the word typically doesn't come the first time we hear. It comes when we begin to apply, when we understand. Just as an aside, that's one of the reasons why our small groups for us are so important, why we do them on a very specific way. It's easy to come to a small group on a Wednesday and hear a teaching. And then go to a church on Sunday and hear a teaching. Perhaps listen to a podcast in the week and hear a teaching. Maybe listen to a YouTube sermon in the week and hear a teaching. There's nothing wrong with any of those. But if we never slow down, stop, pause, ask ourselves, what is this word saying to me? How am I applying this word to my life? Then all of those other words just become encouragement and very few of them are instruction. Then it's just, I feel better and I'm forever feeling better about my life because there's a great minister who's preaching great words and making me feel better, but no transformation is happening because I'm not allowing the word to find root in my life. Small group is a great place where we can come together and we can say, this is how I want to apply this in my life. And next week someone comes and asks, did you apply it? And you're like, no, not quite a little bit. Okay, next week. Let's keep applying it. Let's keep growing together. Practical teaching that moves us to action is one of the primary things that God uses to grow our faith. I am so thankful that right from an early age as a Christian, you know, maybe even before that, I I guess I was a, a type of normal Christian, grew up in a Christian home like many of us, a traditional home. And probably from the age, as long as I can remember, put it that way, we went to church virtually every single Sunday. You know, the heart sore thing for me about that is up to the age of 18, I can't remember a single message in all of those years. It's not that they weren't reading from the Bible. It's just there was something missing, maybe not even in the preaching, but there was something missing in me and how I was hearing. I came to the faith. I decided to follow Christ on myself. I put my faith in Jesus, continued going to church every Sunday. And the crazy thing is now I can sit here for the rest of the day, all day and talk about messages that I remember somebody preaching. Even in dead churches, because they were still teaching the word. But what has changed? Not so much. Obviously, there was a change in the people who were sharing, but there was also a change in me who was listening. I allowed the word to begin to change. I wasn't just sitting there looking at the watch, hoping when is the next time that I can leave? Is this thing almost finished because I need to be gone? Coming to church every Sunday, 
I mean, I, I'm, let, um, let me just take my pastor's hat out for a while in the sense of preaching. <laughs> let me put my pastor's hat on in the sense of a shepherd who cares for sheep and wants to see them grow and wants to see them fed. One of the healthiest things that you can do for your own spiritual life is to make a priority commitment to attend on Sundays. One of the reasons for that is because you are hearing the word and faith comes by hearing. We need to be taught. Timothy needed to be taught. I continually still need to be taught. All of us need to be taught. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys are here, but I want to encourage you as we continue to invest in people's lives to make disciples, let's trust God to build within them a desire and a love to come and sit under the teaching of the word. Obviously in our context, there's Bible school with his teaching of the word. There's Sundays with his teaching of the word. The second area in which we grow in faith, the first was in practical teaching. When we take the word, we hear the word, we apply the word. The second is in our private disciplines. So the first one is very public. The second one is very private. Matthew 6, I've just highlighted some, it's not the full chapter, the full passage here, just a couple of verses. Jesus speaking again, he says, when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Just a quick pause there. That's not saying we shouldn't pray in public with other people as well. Scripture is clear about that. We must pray with others as well. But he's saying there's something about a private discipline when we shut the door and it is just me and the father. Why do we do that? Because then your father who sees everything will reward you. The contrast here is when we are praying on the street corner and we're seeing everybody else must see that I'm praying how spiritual I am. What is my reward? My reward is everybody else seeing how spiritual I am. I've got my reward. If my reward is I'm going to God privately, I'm not doing this to get anything except to spend time with God. What do I get? My reward is time with God. Verse 17, he carries on. When you fast, comb your hair, wash your face. No one will notice that you're fasting. In other words, when you're fasting, do it privately. Once again, that doesn't mean we can't fast collectively and kind of the people around you know I'm fasting. Will you pray with me? I'm going to be fasting. The point is I'm not putting on Facebook, hey, everyone, I'm fasting today. I'm so spiritual. No, God, I'm I'm fasting because I want to hear from you. When you fast, comb comb your hair, wash your face, No one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. We grow in faith in our private disciplines. It's amazing to me how in the context of following Jesus, discipline has sometimes become a swear word. We have discipline quiet times. No, don't do that. That's just religion. No, sometimes discipline is beautiful before God as well. The first thing perhaps when I do, I wake up every morning is I spend time with the Father. It's a discipline. I set my watch to wake up early in the morning perhaps to pray as a discipline. I don't go to bed before I have whatever it may be as a discipline. And Sometimes we want to throw that away, but there is something about disciplines that cause us to grow. There is something about being disciplined in our spiritual life couple of things that we should be disciplined around. The first one is prayer. Prayer which takes on many forms. Prayer which is private communication just with God. Sometimes just pouring our hearts, just communing, just being with God. Sometimes our prayer, and I love that prayer course we did, intercession. I'm praying for other people. There's warfare prayer and there's a different time and place for all of them. And we need them all in our life. We need to be disciplined in our prayer which would include fasting. I wonder how many of us here fast regularly, whatever regularly might mean for you. I wonder how many of us here, we have never fasted before. I want to encourage you. Jesus says, when you fast, not if you fast, take one day. I promise you, you won't die. If you do, Brenda will come lay hands on you. Take one day and say, God, from this morning when I wake up until this evening when I go to bed, I'm not going to eat. I'll drink water only. Philip, a whole day not eating, I'm going to, no, you won't die. Bear Grylls has done it many times. In the desert, you won't die. 
Your body will tell you you will die, but there is something in a spiritual dimension which you'll begin to experience. Fasting is a beautifully powerful thing. So prayer and fasting is an important personal discipline if you want to grow in the faith. Another important personal discipline is Bible study. We should, I believe, all of us have regular times of Bible study in our life, whether it's daily, weekly, however it may look for you. Bible study should include at least three different things. Memorization, taking passages of Scripture and remembering them, learning them off by heart. It's amazing how we can learn kind of songs and lyrics and a thousand different things off by heart and suddenly we struggle to learn Scripture. Learn Scripture. But then two ways of Bible study. The one is memorizing, sorry, three, memorizing. Then we should have Bible reading where I take the scripture and I read it. Almost like a novel, but not quite. I read it with a question, God, what are you saying to me? And I read perhaps a, and kind of you want to do this in a structured way as well. It's probably not ideal to just let the Bible fall and wherever it flaps open, I'm reading that today probably read a book at a time and I'm reading through Genesis and I'm, God, what, I, what can I learn about you? And more than that, what do you want to tell me about me? God, how do I grow in faith when I'm reading scripture? We should do that regularly. And then the third one is what I would call Bible study, which is different to Bible reading. Bible reading, I'm taking the passage and I'm reading through the passage. I'm looking at the whole story. I'm reading about Jesus with a woman at the well and I'm encouraged by it and I'm just edified in a sense. In this Bible study where I take the woman at the well and I get a Bible dictionary or two and I get, if I, like most of us probably here, can't speak Greek or Hebrew and I get a, a very accurate translation and I study and I look at this word for word and I say, in this one sentence, what is Jesus saying to this woman? And it's a lot slower, but I'm studying it. I'm digging in and it's different to just reading. Perhaps I read the scriptures in the morning. God, I just want to go into this day with, speak to me today. And God speaks to us in that way. But there's something that happens in our faith when we study the word, when we dig in, when we slow down. So I want to encourage you around those three. Worship should be a private discipline. I, I love that we worship collectively like in song as we do on a, a Sunday, typically as we come together. But you, know, you should be worshiping privately. You should be putting on music or reading the Psalms. There are a variety of different ways in which you can worship, in which you can make much of who Jesus is. And then the Bible also talks about doing good, acts of righteousness as discipline, giving, faithfully giving to where God has called you to give. It may be to certain individuals, to certain missions organizations most likely to the church family that you are part of. When God speaks to you about giving, that's important private discipline that we should hold on. And I've seen it over and over and over, specifically with young people as they begin to grow in the faith. The single best financial decision they can make is to obey what God says about our money. To take the first 10% of whatever I earn and say, God, this is yours. And to say, God, I have faith that God, you can do more with 90% of my money than I can do with 100%. God, if I trust, if I give 10% to you, so there's 90% left, God, I trust that you can do more with that 90 than I would have been able to do with 100 if I've kept it all. God, because I'm a person of faith. As we're giving, personal, personal spiritual disciplines, they tune our hearts to the heart of God and they underscore personal accountability to our heavenly Father. Within our context, how can we grow in our personal disciplines? Well, that's a personal thing. But one of the ways is an accountability. Like, you know, when you want to start going for a run, for all the unfit people like me, I'm super unfit at the moment. The fit people is not a problem. If I want to start getting fit, the best way is to say, find somebody else who's unfit. That's always a good start. And say, can we go for a run tomorrow morning or go to the gym tomorrow morning? Okay, we'll meet you at six o'clock at that place. Now it's 10 to six. If I haven't made an appointment to meet them there, I'm just going to roll over and keep sleeping. You know, I'm one of those people. Every now and again, I get an urge to go for a run and then I roll over and it goes away. Okay. But if I've made an appointment to say with someone, 
hey, let's meet tomorrow morning at six o'clock. 10 to six tomorrow morning comes. I'm getting out of the bed, not because I want to go for a run. I'm getting out of the bed because somebody's going to be waiting for me. And if they're waiting for me, and they're probably thinking exactly the same thing. And if we both knew it, we'd both just roll over and sleep further. But there's something that that accountability brings. Small group perhaps is one place in which we can be accountable to one another. Where there perhaps is one other individual who I can connect with and I can say, listen, I want to have Bible study every morning this week. Will you phone me at 10 to 6 in the morning? Wake me up. Make sure I'm awake. Or phone me at 6 o'clock in the evening and ask me, how did my Bible study go this morning? Perhaps even we can meet together and you're going to sit on that side of the room and I'm going to sit on this time of the room and we're going to do Bible study sort of in the same space, keeping one another accountable to do it, even if we're doing it all private. Fine. Anyway, just finding a way to get somebody to help me to grow in my personal discipline. Accountability works brilliantly for that. And then the last one for this morning is what we call personal ministry. You'll notice these are all P's because... Andy Stanley got hold of them and made them nice for us to remember. Practical teaching, private disciplines, and personal ministry. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, we are God's masterpiece. You sitting here are God's masterpiece. Did you know that? Did you ever think of yourself as God's masterpiece? The next time the enemy wants to come and tell you, you're not good enough, say, I'm God's masterpiece. If you work, walk into God's museum of art, I'm front and center, the masterpiece. God put me there. So you might not think I'm good enough, devil. I don't care. Jesus thinks I'm his masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. The third way in which we grow spiritually is by engaging personally in the good things that God has prepared for us. We call this ministry. The word ministry And its root form literally just means serving. Just serving others. Ministry is going to look different for all of us in different ways, in different lives. You know, but standing behind the coffee table, making coffee for people, we're serving. That's ministry. Laying hands on people who come forward for prayer. That's ministry. Going on a missions team. That's ministry. The point is I am actively involved in serving other people. I need forgotten. I did the count. I think just when I left and I was no longer officially a student anymore after a very long time of being a student, seven years as a student, I worked out that in that seven years, if I'm not mistaken, I spent six months on missions teams in that seven years. I know a large part of my faith in Christ happened on those missions trips. So much of what I know of God, what I understand of God, my ability to trust God, my capacity to receive from God, so much of that grew, so much of that increased because I spent time on missions teams. Erna was part of some of those teams with us. We would take six weeks on end. If you want to grow, not only spiritually, just as a human, lock yourself in a small bus with 20 people for six weeks. You will grow or die, I promise you. Okay, you probably die first and then you grow. But there's something beautiful that happens when you go through that process. When you get out of your comfort zone, you begin to serve, be willing to serve other people. We grow when we go. We grow when we allow God to use us to impact other people's lives. Too often in in church, we think that when I am mature enough, when I'm strong enough, when I'm ready enough, then I will go. Here's the secret. Maturity comes from ministry, not for ministry. Maturity is not a prerequisite for ministry. Maturity is definitely prerequisite for leadership. That's a different question. But maturity comes from serving other people. I don't have to be mature and then I serve other people. Does that make sense? You know, some of us are sitting and saying, God, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to be used by you. I'm not ready to go pray for my neighbor. I'm not ready to make a meal for my neighbor. I'm not ready to go to Live Village. I'm not ready to go to Tabang. God, there's somebody's better. God, I'm not ready to do. I'm not ready. There's someone better. You're in fantastic company. 
Because I have this other book, which I suggest you read often. It's called the Bible. And in this book, it is full of stories of people who felt they were not ready, but God used them anyway. God has never been intimidated by you and me feeling we're not ready. Because guess what? You'll never be ready for God. You're never going to be ready for what God wants you to do. It's like Caitlin is becoming ready to be a parent for the first time. She will never be ready and neither will Hank. None of us, I don't know if any of you as parents were ready when that first baby, I wasn't ready. I don't think it doesn't matter how many courses of readiness, you're not ready. Doesn't mean you can't prepare, but you could always have been more ready. I'm far more ready now after I've had kids for 10 years for my firstborn. If I could rewind, that would be amazing. If I could parent my firstborn after having 10 years of parenting experience, that would have been brilliant. But I wasn't, and we never will be. God has never been stopped by somebody who says, I'm not ready. Ministry positions us. It positions us to experience God's power working through us, and it forces us to be consciously dependent on God. There are a few things that are going to make your faith grow as much as God. I've said I'm going to do this. I'm going to share this testimony to 200 people here today. I've never spoken in front of people before. So God, it's you or bust. God, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to pray for the sick, sick person now. And there are all these people watching God, so it's you or bust. God, I can't heal them, but you can. My faith is going to grow in that moment. Something happens. When we step up, obviously in our context for that, we have our let's go teams, Le Village and Tabang coming up. We have a group they call it Street Beat who go out on Thursday nights to the strip area, which is there in Linwood where all the clubs are. And they go and they just minister to people, pray with people, share with people. Get them to share some testimonies in the next couple of weeks. But I'm pretty sure one of the things they're going to say is their faith is growing when they step out. Am I right, John? John leads that. Something happens when I step out and I say, God, I'm willing to be used by you. Simply serving somewhere is a great start. Maybe you're saying, I'm I'm not ready to go out on a Thursday night and tell people about Jesus because I was there on Wednesday night drunk with him. It's probably not right for me to go on Thursday, be with, tell them about Jesus. Number one, You're never going to be ready. You might as well start. But number two, find somewhere to start serving. If that's too intimidating for you to go to street beat, then say to Sarah and say, Sarah, can I sit behind the camera and push record on Sunday so that the people who weren't here this week can watch on YouTube during the week and catch up on the message? Can I come up a little bit earlier and mop the floor and just clean up the cookie crumbles, the the cookie crumbs that have crumbled or find somewhere to serve. You might not doubt it. You might doubt it. You might not believe me, but I promise you, you will grow when you start serving. Something in our spirit, something in the way God has put us together is designed in that way. As a matter of fact, Jesus came, his disciples said, actually the disciples mom, we all have moms like this, don't we? Which of my kids is going to sit at your seats on the left and the right, Jesus, when you're in heaven? James. John's mom and James's mom. And Jesus says, no, it doesn't work like that. But if they want to be great in the kingdom, this is how you become great in my kingdom. You serve other people. Your faith is going to grow as you find ways to serve. As you find ways to wake up just a little bit earlier, to be there, to serve someone else, to stay just a little bit later, your faith will grow. So three areas that I want you to go and pray about, to think about, to practically say, if your prayer is like those disciples, Lord, show us how to increase our faith. Here are three ways in which your faith will increase. Sitting under practical teaching, finding ways to apply that teaching. Growing in your personal disciplines, spending time privately in prayer, in worship, in giving in fasting, and then in personal ministry, stepping out and serving other people 
your faith will grow. Can we stand together this morning? I'd love for us to pray together. Jesus, we're just so thankful again this morning for your incredible goodness in our lives, Lord. God, I thank you that as we sit here, you have given every single one of us, every one of us a masterpiece from your hand, Lord. You have given us a measure of faith. And so we bring that faith back to you, God, and we pray, show us how to increase our faith, Lord. God, we believe, help our unbelief. Help us to grow, Lord, in those areas where we struggle, Jesus. God, we pray that next month and next year, Lord, our faith would not look the same as it does today, Lord Jesus. That somehow our faith would have grown, Lord Jesus. That somehow our spirit men would be stronger. Lord, somehow our love for you would have grown, Lord God. Our ability to trust you, to follow you would have expanded. Father, I pray that as a church, we will grow in faith. But like the church in Thessalonica, Lord, that our faith would grow abundantly, Jesus. We ask, God, that you would breathe on our faith, that you would breathe grace over our faith, Lord. And that even in this week, Lord, you would lead us in the way that you have prepared so that our faith may grow for your name's sake. Amen. Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash shofarpretoria.org.